Two years ago, a two litre bottle of olive oil cost you about seven pounds in the supermarket. Today, that same two litre bottle costs around 16. I mean, this is a 750 milliliter bottle. I'm not made of money. Plus I got weak wrists, you know, I can't be carrying all that. But it does serve as an example of the impact inflation has had on all of our day-to-day -day lives. And today we got the latest inflation data. The headline rate of inflation, so-called CPI, is the lowest it's been in over two years. The fall from 3.8% to 3.2% this month is a move in the right direction, but it's higher than the experts expected. They thought it would be 3.1%. That might seem like a small difference, but it speaks to the uncertainty even those in the know have around the direction of inflation. And it's gonna raise further question marks about you know, exactly when interest rates might come down. Each month I sit here and I give you my thoughts on the numbers that make up the big number. And today we're gonna to do the exact same. Let's take a look at the inflation numbers themselves first. This table is a breakdown of the major components that make up the 3.2% figure. You can see food and non-alcoholic beverages are the biggest downward force on the overall number, dropping a full 1% in the last month. That does still mean that your average basket of shopping is getting more expensive though. Clothing and footwear inflation also slowed and furniture and household goods did get cheaper. They deflated in price. You can see here that the growth went from 0% to minus 0.9%. But really all the gains here have been made up in familiar areas, namely food inflation, which has come down a lot from the ridiculous near 20% levels we saw just one year ago. But when the Bank of England looks at inflation, they tend to strip out food and energy prices as they're often more volatile and influenced by external factors, wars, droughts, international issues basically. Once they strip out the food and energy, they call what is left core inflation. And it's this type of inflation that really speaks to how persistent the inflation problem is in the UK, the domestic inflation, if you will. We can see those numbers reflected on the same table here by the service inflation and also by the core measure here, which you can see excludes energy, alcohol and tobacco. For a service-based economy like the UK to have 6% service-based inflation and for it to be creeping down at a rate of 0.1% a month is not what we want to be seeing. I was hoping that we would see a meaningful decline in the service number, but yet again, that's just not materialized. The media focus on the CPI number and comparisons to the USA and how we might be doing better than them for once ignores this number. And you know that Bailey and his band of merry bankers will be looking at this number and thinking we need that to come down meaningfully. An indicator that we might want to look at for this would be wage growth and unemployment. Service businesses, their biggest cost really are wages. So an easing in the rate at which wages are growing and a rising unemployment rate might imply that the tight labor market, which we've had for a long while now, is easing and basically staff have less ability to push up wages, which service companies then just lump onto the cost of their services. The ONS released data yesterday on this, which showed that unemployment rates have risen to 4.2% from 3.9%. Think of it this way. If you have more people who are unemployed, companies have a bigger pool of people to employ from, meaning workers have less ability to negotiate wages at higher levels. Annual pay growth is still in the positive, but that rate of increase is falling. At its peak, total pay, which includes bonuses, was going up at a rate of 8.5%. That's now fallen to 6%. Much of that wage growth, though, that we've seen in real terms was just kind of pissing into the wind. As we can see during this period of high wage growth here, the real wage growth, so after we adjusted for inflation, was negative. The dark blue and green lines are below zero. Because even though wages were growing, people were getting poorer in real terms as the cost of everything was going up. It's only actually since wage growth peaked here that we've seen real incomes adjusted for inflation improving. You can see here that the dark green and blue lines are finally above the zero rate. But I doubt many of you sitting there are going, you know what, I feel richer today than I did before, especially in the context of this 3.2% CPI inflation number. And there's a very good reason for that. The Office for National Statistics, when compiling this comparison or any other data, prefers to look at CPI H. The H includes housing costs. And you know, as someone who lives in a house myself, I'm gonna say that this thing right here is a pretty big part of my monthly outgoings. And not including it in any cost of living comparison is a pretty big omission. This is even more pertinent this month as I imagine many of you like me will have had your council tax bail bills through the post this month. So let's take a look at the CPI with the housing cost element included which is really the most accurate data that we get on the impact of the cost of living crisis on our day-to-day -day lives. The consumer prices index, including owner-occupier housing costs, CPIH, rose by 3.8% in the 12 months to March 2024, unchanged from February. So CPI fell, but CPIH didn't move. That tells us that housing costs are increasing, and we can see that plain as day if we look at this chart here. The dark blue line is this representation of owner-occupier housing costs. 
and they're at the highest rate they've been since 1992. That was actually a year that we saw massive amounts of repossessions of homes as well. About 75,000 homes were repossessed in 1992. I'm not saying that's going to happen again now, but it just kind of points to the burden that's being placed on homeowners at the minute you know, relative to how bad it was back then as well. This increase in pressure on household costs is demonstrated by this table. We see the main drivers upwards here are rents in yellow and OOH, which we looked at a minute ago in purple. The biggest component of OOH is mortgage interest payments. The side effect of the Bank of England's main tool designed to combat inflation, which is the raising of interest rates, is now the biggest single inflationary force in most people's daily lives. It's this sort of cruel irony that in order to combat inflation over here, we need to inflate things over here, so we take money out of your pocket. And it shows really how blunt the tool of raising interest rates is in terms of combating all of this. This would be okay if we were seeing meaningful declines in the service and core numbers, because that would be telling us that the plan is working. But as I've been saying now for two years, it's the service and core numbers we need to see move down before I think we'll be able to discuss the cutting of interest rates. It's kind of funny as literally last night I was reading articles that said the UK was doing better than America and we may be cutting rates sooner. Now, 10 hours later, it seems these hopes have faded. The next Bank of England monetary policy meeting is on the 9th of May. More inflation data will come out on the 22nd of May. I believe based on the figures from today and the fact that the core numbers are sticky, I just can't see rates coming down at the next meeting unless the Bank of England knows something about the next set of data that we don't. But I want to quote the Bank of England directly from this release on their website on the 21st of March titled, Why are interest rates high and when might they fall? We will keep interest rates high for long enough so inflation gets back to 2% and stays there. I don't think today's figures put us anywhere near that yet. The most recent monetary policy report we got from the Bank of England forecasted inflation to fall to 2% in around June only then to bounce back up again. And look at the orange line instead, which is without energy. The decline to 2% is a long old road. I do think we'll see rates decline before then, and many experts, the same experts who got estimates wrong today, think we'll see cuts towards the end of the year. But there's another factor to consider now around the timing of these cuts, and that is the general election. A general election is expected to be held either later this year or early in 2025. Traditionally, it's seen as unwise to cut interest rates during an election, as the move could be seen to be politically motivated. Two former members of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee stated that the central bank may be reluctant to first cut during the actual formal election campaign period in order to avoid anything surprising or newsworthy. But ultimately, these are unusual times that we find ourselves in. And William Buter, I'm sorry if I butchered your name there, but he was part of the team that decides on interest rates in the past, thinks the bank wouldn't hesitate to cut rates due to the election timing. But it certainly complicates the narrative further as the bank would need to weigh up sticking to their own mandate versus the political implications of dropping rates during an election. The plot thickens, unlike my olive oil, which I'm now actively watering down because it's so goddamn expensive. But yeah, I'll continue to sit here every month reporting on this until, you know, the problem goes away completely. And I'll see you soon for a normal video. Thank you.